Unfortunately, Dario Dave passed away before I could get any, like, good footage of him. So... Yeah, I mean, you're probably already used to this. Okay, enjoy the podcast. When it comes to aquarium keeping, I think we all go through the same process. You start, you hear some shit. Uh, some of it's true, some of it's not. Then you start to learn more. You hear more shit. You think that's true, but then you come back around, you realize a lot of that shit's also bullshit. That's what we're going to be talking about today. <laughs> this is the, the Addressing tips. Aquarium Myths podcast. Yes. Let's podcast. <laughs> some of them are true. Yeah, some of them aren't. Some of them are true. We got most of the Community Tank Discord, and if you want to check out our Discord and follow our podcast, go to discord.gg slash fish. Um, have submitted a bunch of different myths or aquarium things that they've heard that they want to have us talk about. Isn't that swell? It's very swell. You know, I bet people are also wondering why we've been gone for so long, so we should probably explain that Andy's Funk. back to full-time work, Funk, Funk had, had a, a child... <laughs> Uh, I moved across the country, so it's been kind of a busy time for all of us. Except spirit, um, Spiritual's done jack shit. You graduated or something, right? Well, I mean, that was back in, like, May because of COVID. <laughs> I haven't done anything. Okay. Well, Spiritual's just been lazy, but the rest of us have had problems. I actually considered, I, I, I was like, if this goes on another month, I'll just do a solo podcast. And everyone will be like, why is this just Spiritual? And he's like, yeah, hey guys, you just had to breed slugs, I don't know. Do you guys have any myths you want to start with, or do you want to hop right into the ones that have been suggested to us? I think let's hop into the ones that have been suggested, and then we'll kind of just, like, you know, if we have something that expands upon it, like, we can go into that. Like, if someone asks, I don't know, about, like, filtration, then we can, like, talk about plants a bit or something like that. Cool. So let's just... Yeah, feel free to add any more. Our yeah. first one is by Willard. Great guy. Terrible at Among Us, I should add. Um, <laughs> he said, Melifix is a medication, is the myth that he has heard Melifix being a medication uh i think i think Melifix Melifix on the bottle this is the biggest complaint i have with Melifix on the bottle it says treats bacterial infections Melifix does not do that Melifix <laughs> is not an antibiotic what Melifix does do and what i think it does fairly well in my opinion is what it says right below treats bacterial infections which is Rapidly repairs damaged fins, ulcers, and open wounds. Um, I think Melfix is kind of like a fish band-aid sort of deal. You know, you put it into the tank, and if your fish are beating up on each other or uh, otherwise have some sort of superficial trauma, I think it does help with that. But um, it does not help with bacterial infections um, in the slightest. One, one thing I want to add is that I just googled the Melifix bottle, and Andy knows it word for word, and that's frightening. <laughs> that's kind of, you... that's kind of cool, Andy. <laughs> what special Andy, talents some... do you have? I can recite the Melifix bottle label. <laughs> yeah. So, Andy, have you used Melifix for? Yeah, I have. Because... Um, I have a bottle of Pond Strength Melifix. A uh half gallon of it at all times because i have a lot of big mean fish and they beat up on each other and when they do i pour in some melfix because i've always used just aquarium salts as my band-aid yeah that works that too. On everyone. that's usually that's what my, I do as well that's my frank's red hot sauce i throw that <laughs> shit on everything <laughs> another um another thing against melfix is people think that uh because it is physically an oil-based uh product it does go to the top of the tank it does it can make a slick at the top of your tank um and so some people think that that can hurt labyrinth fish like bettas grommies anything that'll come up to um take a breath of air with a labyrinth organ i don't think it does at a normal dose i mean the theory is there you know if that oil slick at the top the theory makes sense but in practice i don't think it makes a difference all right. Well, I mean, you talked about it being kind of a band-aid solution, and that's probably the reason why I would never use it, because I'll only treat a tank if there's something, like, seriously and obviously wrong. And yeah. um, otherwise, I'll just, you know, work on conditions and everything like that. But I know you have a lot more tanks, so that can be a lot harder to do. Yeah, I mean, it's it's on antibiotic. Uh, it helps, I think. 
for superficial damage. Just think, a little thing for... Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sir. No, I was just going to say, I think this discussion kind of perfectly encapsulates the kind of like stuff I want to talk about today. It's stuff where like, it's not... It works, it doesn't work. It's like there's more of some sort of in-between thing. So like Malefix isn't completely useless, but it's not everything it says it can do. It's somewhere in the middle. And that's kind of like what I wanted to get through with this podcast is like, there's a lot of things you'll hear, like you hear the new, like, I don't, I don't know how to categorize the types of fish keepers, but you'll hear one side like saying like, no, not this. And the other side saying, yes, this. And in reality, it's kind of somewhere in between. Mm Mm-hmm. And just a side thing, Andy, say that you do have a bacterial infection, what's your go-to medication? I mean, depending on the bacterial infection, um, conomycin, commonly sold as C-chem's Conoplex, is a pretty good, um, very mild antibiotic for most things, but it really depends on what exactly is wrong with the fish. Uh, if I am very hesitant to throw antibiotics at something without a proper diagnosis, just because... Um, of the potential of creating superbugs. Um, I ethically don't think it's good to throw antibiotics at stuff because then, you know, stuff gets worse with this entire superbug antibiotic resistant bacteria situation. And then you become Canada where you ban (laughs) all sort of over the counter um, fish medication, which sucks. And it's because um, people are overusing them. Uh, All right. But. To give you an answer without just saying it depends, <laughs> um, <laughs> conomycin, but also it depends. Yeah, I conomycin is kind of the one that I see often, and Canada is kind of, I live in Canada, so it's a little bit harder for me to get all those medications, but canomycin I can still get, so that's usually my predominant one, and if it's something that's significantly difficult or harder to treat that canomycin doesn't treat, then sorry fish, you're going to die. Yeah, I mean, there are other I, good I medications. Um, metronidazole is a different antibiotic that's going to primarily target gram-positive bacteria, which is going to be the less common sort of bacterial infection you'll see in fish. Um, another pretty mild one, um, furin-2. Uh, I believe that's nitrofurazone, but don't quote me on that. Is another more harsh antibiotic that's a more broad-spectrum um, as well as stuff like Maricin, Maricin 2, Maricin Oxy, those are going to be more um, harsher medications. So it just really depends what you're treating, you know. Um, someone in the chat said, meme said, include how our fish die because of the stupid law. That's true. You know, it really sucks that it's gotten to the point where Canada has banned every single fish medication without going to a vet. Um... I understand the reasoning for it, which is overuse of antibiotics, but it so does suck for fish keepers. Um, so anything else on that, or do you want to go to the next myth? I think, that's, think that covers it pretty well. Let's go to the next one, which is, oh, here's a fun one, the inch per gallon rule. Yeah, I could go right into this, or yeah, I could yeah. not just talk for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I have I no am... problem talking for an hour. Frankly, I think that I'm, for most of these questions, probably one of the most qualified to answer. I would agree. But uh, <laughs> I don't want this yeah. just to be the, the Andy, Andy ca- talking the for Andy an hour. Cast. Yeah. Well, Andy, I want you to uh, answer inch per, inch per gallon rule. Answer that. Just debunk it in as many is as few words as possible first. Okay. Um, inch per gallon rule for small fish is generally pretty good. Uh, when you get to bigger fish, obviously not as good. You're not going to put a four-foot-long <laughs> red tail cat in a 40-gallon tank. Uh, <laughs> but I yeah. think that the inch-per-gallon rule with fish under maybe two, three inches is pretty good. Um, in fact, it tends to be a little bit conservative, which is nice for a lot of newer fish keepers. Um, I think it's generally pretty okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. I would assume that we're all going to immediately go to hating on it. But I do think for those new fish keepers, it can be useful in a lot of a lot of ways. I mean, it can really help them get an idea of how many things they should put in. I still think it's ridiculous, you know, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Even with small fish, like, like I'm sorry, but I'm going to put more than 
20 guppies in a 20 gallon <laughs> but um, but i guess i am just breeding them as food so that doesn't matter so much but um, yeah i think yeah. It's, it's a good place to yeah. start i i would agree with that because i mean otherwise you get people like me when i first started i had a nine gallon tank with say it with me guys 22 fish <laughs> Wait, it was pretty Christ. Yeah, it was. Uh, that's why I started my Blackwater, and I do. I think it's a good place to start, but I think it's important. Like, I mean, I I don't think anyone st- like sticks to it throughout, but I think it's like, yeah, you know, it's a good place for people to start. But it's you know you want to evolve sort of out of that slowly, and I mean, but there, there's reasons to to like there's ways to overstock tanks. I don't want to say overstock, but that's when we get into stuff like plants and ensuring you have enough oxygen, and I mean we can talk about that as well. Because, just over filtering well yeah because i think when when i started so when i first started i'm going to speak from my personal experience it was i just thought okay like not too many fish based on the size of the tank and then people started talking to me about plants and how plants can help to manage your nitrates and if you're doing enough water changes you can likely have more small fish because then you're dealing with those like you're dealing with that buildup. so then okay i figured that out cool but then i think after i learned that i didn't initially understand the like filtration stuff so i wasn't actually i didn't have like that great of a filter on the tank so i'm like why aren't my fish doing well oh it's because they're not getting enough damn oxygen so those are like the three stages for me yeah i i think it's a good thing for new people more I, so I than the thing that i probably hate most when i ever someone asks me a fish question and they give me this answer i get more angry than anything is the oh oh i'll upgrade later <laughs> no one who's ever said that has ever upgraded later <laughs> yeah, dude i'll upgrade so, later i promise so i like the inch per gallon rule because it can give some of these newbies at least an idea what to do it's it's better than fucking aq advisor what that's, actually a, shit show. that's actually a really good point though <laughs> aq advisor makes like no sense like 95 percent of the time i think aq advisor said my Blackwater was overstocked. There's like ten fish in there, and it's twenty gallons. I guess. I mean, maybe they're arowanas. Maybe <laughs> they're not right. arowanas. <laughs> it's sparkling garami and corys. Um. Also, spiritual. You completely <laughs> skipped over one of our questions. Oh, I... One of <laughs> one person just wrote in Gobi, and to that, I would say yes. Yeah, Next I agree. Question. Yeah, Gobi. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, Gobi. okay next question to what extent will ph harm or affect your average fish man sounds like a high school lab that would be turned oh i want to i want to do this one i want to do this one (laughs) go ahead all right so i a lot of people hear me preach about how ph isn't anything to worry about and there's there's always an asterisk on that all right when when people always tell me oh yeah oscar he says ph isn't real no no (laughs) ph is real i'm not saying that I'm not saying it's fictitious. It's very much real. But <laughs> but it's probably not what the problem in your tank is. Yeah. 95% of the time. I think mm. the amount of times you see a new aquarist who has like fish that are maybe meant for like 6 to 7 pH and then he tests his water, his fish is like spinning circles like he's in a laundry machine. <laughs> and it's like, "Oh, my pH is 7.4 and they're meant for pH between 6 and 7." So this is what is doing this to him. No, <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> uh, then he does I see ammonia, it and it's so like much. Um, yeah, that's it's very rarely a problem. I mean, obviously, if you're you know you're at, you have a fish that's been living in like low six pH and you're trying to drop them in like eight point five, you should probably you know be ready for a long acclimation or something. But generally, that's not going to be your problem. Yeah. And more often than not, those people who say it's their problem end up doing all these ridiculous things to try and change their pH, and a constantly fluctuating pH is always going to be more of a problem than a pH that's slightly off. The the asterisk on that is there are a few fish that I've encountered that really do need certain lower pHs. I know a lot of wild betas, um, some some discus. You just want that lower pH, and they're not going to thrive without it. And the big one is there's a lot of fish that you want to breed, and you cannot breed them without certain pHs. That's just how they be. But that's that's my tangent on that. No, that's that's good. I, I'll throw in really quick. You mentioned like people like you know freaking out because their pH. Yeah, when I first started, uh, you know, I I was like freaking out because I brought home some neon tetras, and the website said their the pH should be like I don't know. I think it was like six point eight. My pH was like six point like four. Oh no. 
And then, uh, you know, I dumped them in, they all died because I didn't cycle the tank, so... <laughs> Spiritual, you fucking monster. It was the pH. <laughs> no, it was the... Dude, I was like, I was actually like, get. I was actually like, I remember, I was like freaking out. I'm like, oh no, I'm going to kill these poor fish because of the pH. My dad's like, let's just put them in. I'm like, you're right. And then they all died because of ammonia poisoning. It's like the fucking, the PetSmart, what's it? The PetSmart change your pH to 7 thing where you just sprinkle in the fucking powder. <laughs> I hate the, it. the fucking ammonia down or whatever. Isn't that, that's a thing. God. I don't know why. This yeah, is the same um, store that the, the when I bought these, the store told me that corridor is like to be alone. So you know that's 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 the last oh, yeah. time I ever went there. They're very territorial. They fight with each other. <laughs> Good lord! All right, I think that's yeah. That kind of covers that. Oh, the next one's yeah. A fun um, one. I want to talk a little bit about it. Oh, okay. Um, right. like Oscar said, there are some exceptions. Uh, stuff like a lot of the wild anabantoids, mm -hmm. betas, peros for Nemes, um, discus also don't like it uh, too high. You know, discus tend to have some issues once you get above like 7.2 or so. But still, a lot of people think, oh, these fish need to be at 4, which, to be fair, you do need that to breed a lot of these wild anabantoids. Um, but they're all fine. Uh, other big exception on the other side is Malawis and Tanganyikans. If you throw your Malawis and Tanganyikans into your 6-8 tap water, they're not going to be very happy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for the most part, yeah, it doesn't matter. As long as you're not, I mean, for breeding, but for just keeping the fish healthy, most fish don't care. All right. Next question? What's our next one? API test kit bad. That's not really a question. It's more of a statement, but... Um, it's it's fine. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's if you want to test your water, the API Master Liquid Test Kit is one of the more um, accurate test kits. Yeah, like people, what? like I can. Okay, I can. I I'll get. I'm a I'm a preacher, and I think we all are like kind of like this that. It's better to like to know your like aquarium and like keep an eye on it than it is to just like test your water every damn day but there's nothing wrong with testing your water and i don't understand why people go on these rants about how like the api test kit isn't accurate enough to test your water dude if your nitrate's high it's going to tell you your nitrate's high like it's not you don't need some like lab grade equipment to know oh hey my ammonia's like the ammonia test is like neon green and my fish are dying uh sorry one thing just to go back i was trying to think yeah. of a fish that will die if you put them in the wrong ph um the one that comes to mind for me is ultim angels those oh, things yeah. will just fucking die in hard water. Like, they just... I mean, they might just die anyway, but in hard water, they really don't do well. Yeah, Altums do not like hard water at all. Um, and API test kits, I mean... Uh, here's one for y'all. Do you think um, test strips are useful in any way? I, I never, think so. I have never they're used test strips, so I wouldn't know. Um, they're going to be less accurate, and... Uh, Less precise is the biggest thing than a liquid test kit, but they're fine. I mean, I just, I tell customers, you know, if, if you want test strips, here's the Tetra test strips. They're like a, a little bit cheaper than buying a master test kit in the long, in the short run, but it's going to be a lot less tests overall, um, and it's, but it's easier. So if the difference between someone new to fish keeping, testing their water and not testing their water is the extra effort of test strips versus a liquid test kit, they should probably use the strips. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one thing a lot of people get wrong about us is everyone says, oh, those TCT guys, they hate testing water. They're completely against testing water. Testing water is a sin to them. No, if you're a new fish keeper, test your water. That's yeah, not I, a bad yeah, thing. Yeah, I agree. What we're mostly saying is when you've had this tank up for like three or four years, I'm not going to test my tank anymore. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's where it's at. It's not changing. Yeah, and yeah. for people like you and I, if we look at our tank, we can see there's something going wrong, you know? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> well, the, the, water our... smell, the water smells like urine. I wonder if my ammonia is high. It's like, it's one of those things. If you're a new Aquarius, there is reason to do it. If you've yeah. been doing this a long time, you probably don't need to do it. I agree with that. I have not tested my water in over, like, what, two years? I've never had a fish die in that same time, except for that one power outage that we don't talk about. Oh no. Uh all right, is that is that that? 
Sure, what's what's next on our thing? How serious is the risk of sickness when getting a wild-caught fish? I'm sure Andy's going to talk about fish TV in Florida at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll talk about fish TV in Florida for a second because you brought it up, and I'll let you all discuss this one okay. for a, until I inevitably come in. <laughs> um, Damn, Andy cocky today. <laughs> <laughs> uh Florida fish farms are riddled with mycobacterium infections. I believe, from what I have gathered and what I've heard from people smarter than myself, that every single fish coming out of every farm in Florida is infected with mycobacterium fish TB. Whether or not they'll show symptoms and whether or not it'll just live in them their entire life, asymptomatic is a different question. But I think that they all have it. Um, which sucks, and it can transfer to you if you're not careful and if you're unlucky. Um... And it can kill the fish pretty easily if they decide to become symptomatic. Uh, but that's just an example of... It's not necessarily wild-caught versus tank-raised fish when you have disease. It's not just... You can't just blanket statement say... Um, fish that are wild-caught are going to have more disease than tank-raised fish. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, is that I don't... I don't really see it being a wild caught thing. Like, I mean, it's. I think it's more complicated than that. I think that's a little bit of a yeah, generalization that we're using there. Um, because I think, in my tank, my tank is almost all wild caught fish, and I think the captive bred ones were the only ones that came in with disease. Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, like Andy brought me a bunch of wild caught fish, and like none of them had. I mean, if you want to, I mean, he thought the hatchet fish had ick, but that was just them biting each other because they're assholes, and then they all killed each other. But that wasn't to blame by a disease. That's just because they're assholes. So, I think the only I fish thought... I don't know if I've ever even had. I mean, there was that weird thing where all my sword tails got bent spines, but we I really don't know what that was about. But that we should give one, uh, so. we should give May five minutes on the podcast now. He's he's itching. He's itching to say something. Do we want to? And let he's it? he's a smart dude. You guys want to let him? Yeah, let's do it. That's a good. That's a good. All right, hey, you're up. Oh shit! I... All right. Yeah, uh, if you want to check my volume real quick, I'm gonna turn you up a bit. One two, one two, one two. Okay, that's good. Look, Maze, Maze, right on this. He's 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 ready. Cool. He's been waiting. So, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at all this stuff, and I I, just, I have comments because you guys are attacking multiple perspectives on each of these topics, which is which is really good. But there's just some little bits and pieces that are missing out. So I'm not gonna address the stuff from before, but I will address this one. Okay. So, uh. In this instance, you, you said a blanket statement doesn't apply, which is absolutely true. However, it's ignoring the fact that when you do have a wild caught fish, the potential for them to be or having had been in contact with some type of contagion or or parasite or whatever is significantly greater than an, a, an enclosed environment if the enclosed yes. environment had not been contaminated to begin with. However, their resistances will also be greater because they've been exposed and through generations have been constantly exposed and been able to develop these resistances as well. So you can have a whole tank of wild caught fish and that's great. And they've all been exposed to the wild and therefore through heredity have developed these resistances. But if you introduce a bunch of fish that haven't had that opportunity, have been captively bred, they have may have weakened out and lost these types of things. So sticking to one side or the other, either staying all captive bred or all wild caught, is probably going to give you your, your widest degree of, of success in the hobby. It's when you start mixing the two that you start having issues. Yeah, yeah I agree I with everything you comments? just said. Absolutely. I think you're generally going to find you're going to find a lot of those wild caught fish are more susceptible to a lot of the diseases you commonly see in aquariums that maybe are not common in the wild because they haven't been exposed to them as much. Yeah, that makes sense. But um, no, I'm absolutely in agreement with you, May. And yeah, and then we definitely, what, what, go ahead. We definitely need to do a genetics or something podcast together. That would be <laughs> awesome. Be fun. We can both do our, our fields. My I field's behavior, agree. so. <laughs> um, I, my field's behavioral ecology and genetics. We're good. Let's do this. All right. I'm, I'm on. <laughs> Whenever. Shoot me, an, uh, shoot me a message. Absolutely, man. I, one thing I do want to say on this is that uh, internal parasites for the most part, generally speaking, are going to be more common on wild-caught fish than uh, tank-raised fish. Again, there are exceptions, camelanus worms yeah. uh -huh. uh, being one of them. Um, but with that said, 
they're still not super common for most fish. And you're, unfortunately, it's not the standard, but if you have a good local fish store getting fish from a good wholesaler, they should um, observe and treat if necessary before you buy the fish. So, yeah, I, th I think that's one of, the, matter. one of the big things that gets overlooked. The number one factor that I think you focus on when you're looking at diseases, your your fish store itself, right? So when I, I don't get very many diseases in my tank because I know my fish store really well. I know how they're treating these fish and I know how long they've been there. And they're always very transparent to me about a history of disease or stuff like this. So trusting your fish store a lot, like, well, not blindly trusting them, but having yeah. trust in your fish store that's been proven will go a long way. Make hey friends guys, with the uh, people of your fish. Hey, hey, Oscar, I'm going to let you finish, but uh, I just wanted to hop on for a quick cameo and just chime in on this, if that's okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, uh, we can hear Funk. you, Funk. Glad Funk to hear you. How you Funk been? had a son. I'm fucking miserable. I had a son. <laughs> well, no, no kids only food. fish yes um no i just i just wanted to just give my two cents in this conversation as someone that's working at a fish store particularly dealing with wild collected animals um yes to to a certain degree it is on the fish store i mean you know they're they're the first line defense you know to, to customers and you know hobbyists but man some of this shit is no joke and you know true quarantine is six to eight weeks and, you know, a fish store is a small business. And if a fish store were to actually maintain a actual six to eight week quarantine, they would never have any fish for sale. You know, they bring in fish every week, every other week, and that those animals go, you know, into quarantine for six to eight weeks. Let's just say there's a 50 percent die off in that process. There's not going to be anything for sale. And, you know, the truth is, yes, you know, find a reputable fish store. Yes. Um, you know, in, invest in, in stores and give stores money that, that truly take care of their fish. But if you're not, you know, being cognizant and quarantining your animals, you're not doing your due diligence as a hobbyist. Um, and that's all I got to say. Also, um, I've given up on fish. I just keep cuttlefish now. I, truly... <laughs> I love your cuttlefish. It has fish in the up. word, so it's okay. Okay. Is a starfish a fish? Yes. Yes, has fish in the word. <laughs> The sea star and cuddle fish are just cuddles. Yeah, yeah that's how it's gonna be. From the <laughs> cuddles. Hey, yeah. the wait. cutlets. Funk, before you go, I just saw that our yeah. next question yeah. is: Should live rock be avoided due to pests? And I would, I would love it if you'd give us a quick rundown on this one, because I know I, you would do it better than anyone. Um, I feel like I've, I've spoke about this for literally hours in previous podcast. <laughs> Every podcast. I know, but give us, give us, give us five minutes of all your vitriol against live rock or dry rock. Okay, um, does live rock bring in pests? Uh, the answer is um, eh, maybe, probably could. I, I think it's, it's a real valid option. But you know, the truth is live rock brings in a lot of things. It brings in um, you know, microfauna, bacteria, copepods, amphipods, sponges, tunicates, polychaetes, which bristle worms are great for aquariums. I don't care what anyone says. Sure, they look creepy, but they are the best to try divorce out there. Uh, it brings in uh, coral polyps if you get you know some healthy you know rock with a short supply chain. Various types of macroalgae if that's your thing. Live rock is is a coral reef. Coral reefs are based on live rock. It's the foundation. It's the bones of any living healthy coral ecosystem. And starting off with dry rock, you are stripping and devoiding your potential coral ecosystem, your living slice of the ocean of all that beneficial microfauna. Do things come in that you don't want? Yeah, sure. Fuck yeah. You know, you might get like a mantis shrimp. You might get a pistol shrimp. You might get an octopus. It's been, it's happened. You know, you could be like, you know, poultry in our server and get a fucking bobbit worm. You know, the, the probably the most terrifying animal on the planet. You know, but these, these incidences are anecdotal and they're really rare. And live rock, you know, five, six, seven years ago when it was a pretty common thing, wild collected live rock was it had a long supply chain. It sat out of the ocean for months sometimes as it sat you know came on a boat from indonesia to the u.s and sat in customs for a while like a lot of stuff died off but it would come back pretty quick starting with just bone white dry rock is probably one of the worst things you can do if you start an aquarium with dry rock a reef aquarium and call it a reef aquarium it's not it's a fucking saltwater tank with pedestals for your coral it's not a true ecosystem and also my last little thing i'm going to say on this is because live rock generally has a long supply chain, a lot of the big stuff dies off or lays dormant, you're going to get 
pests, aptasia, bubble algae, whatever, from coral frags. Because even as diligent as that fish store is, it's just like fish diseases. There might be some sort of microscopic, I don't know, aptasia polyp or piece of nuisance algae that you can't see that they didn't scrub off. And that's what's going to seed your tank with it. Things like, you know, acridine flatworms and parasites on coral, they don't come from the ocean. They come from people switching, train stuff in their tanks. So mm-hmm. if you really, truly really believe Lyrock will bring in pests and ruin your aquarium and starting a saltwater, healthy, living reef ecosystem with dry rock, you're a fucking moron. <laughs> Nice. How was I'm, that? Re- I'm really glad that you were here for this. I know. One I was because... so glad too. I was gonna like. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna be like. I was gonna give like a sad little speech. I was like, man, it really sucks that Funk's. You know, if he hadn't had a son, I don't know. But, <laughs> but you know what? He is here, and that's all that matters. I'm so I, happy I, we got I, you for this one. Talk about great anyone. Timing. Yeah. To anyone that's not in our uh, Discord server that wants to like argue with me or debate me on this, discordgg fish I'm there all night fucking find me um if for all those who want to come here and debate funk on that don't do that do yourself a favor don't do it just <laughs> accept that what he's saying is right because it is and you're just going to embarrass yourself <laughs> all, right. all right fellas um i think i just heard a blowout so i'm gonna go um all right but, yeah. so hey, tell want to say hi absolutely right, bye fun. love you man that was, that, a was great that was epic <laughs> I love that guy. Came at the perfect time. I know, right? So, um, uh, is cycling crucial? Oh boy, this is another one that we always get misquoted <laughs> on. Everyone always says, those TCT guys, they believe that cycling isn't even real. No, it is. We just don't believe that you need to spend 60 days fucking putting in fish food and driving <laughs> Fucking going on Amazon and buying your pure ammonia to cycle your tank. Is Dude, that anybody who uses like industrial grade ammonia for <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. I can't remember who it was, but I remember someone posted they bought like a giant bottle of like literal industrial grade ammonia. And they're like, "Look, I'm gonna cycle tanks," and we're just like, "Why? Why would you do that? Don't do that." There are so many other ways to cycle a tank that are so much easier. Um, I cycle my tanks with just pre-cycled media from other tanks. Yeah. Just take that shit from one filter, move it to the other, give it, what, a few days, and you're usually fine. But it's it's ridiculous to do this 60 days of, what, putting in fish food and waiting for ammonia. Just, there are easier ways. I actually have a, a, a question, because I don't actually know the answer to this. But say, because I've met people who are literally, like, they'll be, like, in the middle of, like, I'm, yeah, they'll be in the middle of buttfuck nowhere. And... They want to start a tank, and like I get, they can get fish, but then they they just like you know where do they get? Do, should they just cycle normally? Like I don't I don't know what to tell them. <laughs> like normally I just say uh, I ask them if they have a friend who has like a fish tank, and they usually say yeah. And then I'm like just ask them for some recycled media. But then there's these people who live in the middle of nowhere. I'm like I don't know. Like <laughs> should they just cycle it the the cringe way or like what? What do you think? What you do is you buy a bottle of Sea Chem Stability oh, yeah, bottled bacterial spores. And it works pretty well. You know, you might get a very slight bit of uh, detectable ammonia in the beginning of your tank being set up. So ideally go for a hardier fish. But that's going to be a lot faster, a lot more stable than um, like a fishless ammonia cycle. And it's going to be um, a lot healthier to the fish than a traditional fish in cycle. There you go. It or, takes like a week to establish that beneficial bacteria. In the meantime, you're adding it's, that bacteria that's going to be eating up any kind, ammonia being produced. It's kind of funny, Andy, because literally I always hear people say that the bottle bacteria doesn't work, but you like... Yeah, um, there there is some truth behind that. Okay. A lot of bottled bacterial products on the market, uh, the most uh, common one that is this that this is the case is going to be the API Quick Start. A lot of them use terrestrial bacterial strains. Um, So what that means for us is you dose that in your tank, and it's a product either designed by an idiot, (laughs) less likely, or it's a product designed to make you have to keep buying it over Uh, and over and over. Because that terrestrial bacteria, you're going to pour it in your tank, it's going to eat up some ammonia and nitrite, but it's going to die off because it's Mm. terrestrial strains of bacteria. Yeah, they can't survive long term. Some of them will, of course, but the vast majority of them will not. 
establish in your filter. Um, but there are good brands that use the correct strains of bacteria. Um, some that come to mind are the Seachem Stability, which is relatively cheap. That's why I tend to recommend it. Um, Microbe Lift Night Out is another good one. Um, Start Smart Complete is a good one. Tetra's Safe Start is a good one. You know, there are very oh few good Tetra products. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> but that's one of them. I think the, um, the root, just real quick, I think the root tabs are good. I, th I think I use the root tabs as well, and they're not actually that bad. Yeah, they're fine. I think that the Seachem root tabs are a little better, but the Tetra yeah. ones are fine. Just want to throw that in there. Um, but that myth just comes from either people being hesitant to use bald bacteria because they're too invested in the month long ammonia cycle <laughs> meme dude i love or that because meme. they've tried the um the ones that don't bad work. brands yeah that makes sense alternatively another thing is these people are saying you know they can't find they don't have any other friends with aquariums or something like that mm -hmm. check for local aquarium clubs yeah that's true check mm -hmm. talk that's to point. people at your stores make friends if there's seriously yeah. no one around you who owns a tank no local fish stores no aquarium clubs <laughs> how are you then, getting fish dude, Cycle at the sixty days. You're probably staring at barns all day. What's the difference? Like... <laughs> yeah. Um, despite like, dude, what watch I've... the cows go by for sixty days. Uh, despite me being a fan of ball bacteria, thing it works well. Um, it's always going to be more stable to take existing media from a cycle tank. Um, and please join your local aquarium clubs. Please support them. There's a lot of good people. You can get a lot of rare fish, um, and you can learn and... a lot. Me specifically, I have never once used bottled bacteria, um, just because I'm always with pre-cycled media. I I can see why some people would use it, but me personally, I feel so much more comfortable taking my filter media from another tank or something yeah. like this. That I, it just yeah. makes me as feel soon as you have as soon as you have your first fish tank set up and established, it's easy to set up this uh, yeah. next yeah. tank. Unless of course you got like a. Media like a 2.5 gallon shrimp tank and you're trying to set up like a 75 or something. Then yeah. Might... <laughs> Just pour the whole tank in. <laughs> it still won't work. Okay. Um, That's... We're working our way through these questions. Yeah. What's what's uh, next? I think we're going to have a few like fast ones here. I don't know. Um, can stress cause fish to get ick? Yes. Next question. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, do we need to say more than that? Or really? <laughs> like, it's a question. We answered it. Like, Stress can make fish much more susceptible to ick and basically yeah. every other disease out there. I don't think I've ever had ick, so I'm probably going to get it in like the next you know few days just because that's how things seem to be going. <laughs> yeah, I think Andy hit the nail on the head. The big yeah. thing is that stress increases your susceptibility. In fact, it increases your... Sub it, it's the same in humans. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not supposed to say this, but a friend of mine who is in here had a staph infection. He did something really stressful over a period of time, and it went everywhere it, oh. it was working fine it was going away on its own and then he had a stressful few days and it started to emerge everywhere oh, that's that's a general rule here with this and yeah amaze on the point here immune system suppression from stress this has been known forever okay sweet uh better fish or good fish well i mean wild ones are yeah wild ones are yeah i that is just suck you know because You'll read online, people say, oh, your betta only lived a year or two? Well, actually, bettas can live up to five years, so you did something wrong. Well, yeah, I do think most of the time, if someone kills their betta in a few months, it's probably their fault. Um, I just don't think that every domestic betta, even in perfect care, is going to live that full five years that bettas can live. Because they're they're bad fish. They're unhealthy most of the time. Because of years and years and years of inbreeding. The massive inbreeding depression. Especially with... What's what's the dragon something? Andy, what's the name? Dragon, dragon scales? Dragon scale. Those things are just terrible. They're terrible. Those are... I mean, find me a dragon scale beta that's over a year old that can still see. Like, they're just poor, sad animals because they've been line bred for far too long and their genetics have almost homogenized to the point where they're just terrible. I mean, we talk about this every week, so I don't want to go into it too much. But Have I defined what I call contemporary fish keeping on the podcast yet? 
No, but you're way too young I don't, to be I don't called. Think you have. <laughs> Contemporary fish keeping is a term that I use to refer to the like internet phase of fish keepers. Yeah. People High that tech aquascape. <laughs> People that, you know, only keep nano tanks, only keep uh, high-tech aquascapes. <laughs> People that think um, you need to ammonia cycle all of your tanks before you put fish in for at least one month. Um, stuff like that. The idea that every single beta can live five years and if you didn't, you did something wrong. Again, like I said, mo I think most of the time when bettas die within a few months or a year... Probably the owner's fault, but not necessarily the owner's fault. Mine got eaten by a pleco. <laughs> no, it <This> didn't. Is... <laughs> well, okay, it died and then got eaten by the pleco. Correct. This is this is why I love Andy. I love Andy because he's two years younger than me, but he feels like he's forty years older than me. He feels like he's my dad talking to me. I love Andy. And I, it is much funnier to tell people my pleco ate the better. I hear that all. I just think I'm tired of hearing that from customers at the store they say yeah i might pleco ate my fish it did not <laughs> pleco yeah well i saw it eating it the pleco ate the corpse <laughs> yeah all right um, uh short-bodied fish are healthy i mean do we need to spend more than one second on yeah that that's one? that's basically the same thing we just said no no they're not no <laughs> when, when animals are supposed to be 12 inches long you can't just compress them and they'll be fine in six <laughs> <laughs> Imagine we put you in a hydraulic press for well, no, because that would destroy you completely. But let's, let's... yeah, it's, it's not like a fucking car where you can take your mini caravan, and you can turn it into the regular mini and cut off like a few inches, and it'll be just fine. <laughs> Fish are not cars; you can't do that. They're not but my short body flower horn lived for a year and a half. Here, hang on. I'm gonna, <laughs> oh. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get one of my pencil fish and make a short, short body pencil fish. Be right back, Andy. Andy, that might be the oldest short body flower horn in existence. <laughs> Do beta sororities work? Who cares? They suck. <laughs> I had a beta sorority. I set up a 40 breeder about four or so years ago. And at its peak, it had about 15 female bettas in it. Very heavily planted with stuff like hornwort to break line of sight. It worked I... for about six months. And they all kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, beta sororities I... suck. <laughs> like, I've... I've they had can wild work. betas in colonies, and I've yeah, had no problem. Yeah, because wild yeah. betas haven't been bred for yeah. hundreds, for if not thousands yeah. of years for aggression. Well, but wild betas, you can absolutely do colonies with a lot of yeah. species, just with your domesticated species that have been line bred for aggression and fancy big fins. No, it ain't gonna happen, Chief. You can't Even just breed wild for caught aggression. Splendons. And... Yeah, I I had a group of wild caught splendons for a while, and it's the same species probably as the domestic beta um males on males had a little bit of aggression a little bit of nipping here and there but there was no male on female aggression no female on female aggression and if you were to put two male bettas into a 10 gallon tank they'd kill each other <laughs> if i put these two male wild caught bettas into a 10 gallon tank there'd be some nipping but they'd be fine it's not an immediate death sentence. It, it annoys me that people are like, whoa, I'm just going to line breed this fish for aggression for 200 years. And then they're like, well, now I want them to be friends. <laughs> yeah, best sororities can work, but I, it's difficult. It doesn't always work. You know what the other one fish. you hear? The other hmm. one you always hear is, well, it depends on the personality of the beta. Oh what God. do you make of that? I mean, yeah. That's true. Yeah, but, yeah I mean, my like, but I've heard seen people whose bettas like can't be kept with anything, and mine was mine just got beat up by my tetras. So yeah, most tetra most bettas are fine with other fish, and are fine with stuff like um, adult cherry shrimp and snails. And other times, you get a betta that you put in with a guppy, and it <laughs> annihilates the guppy, and it kills <laughs> your adult shrimp, and it murders your mystery snail. Not very common, but it happens Angry depending on the boy. fish. You know what? Another, another little thing that affects aggression in some of these fish is a little something called IgEs or indirect genetic effects, and basically that's when genes which affect a phenotype in one individual affect that in another individual, and mm -hmm. 
that's that's in that say that you have one really aggressive beta that aggression may inhibit the aggression in another beta which will then proceed to be less aggressive in future situations there's there's lots of different loops like this where just directly the interactions between these animals can alter how they interact with animals past this point so it's it's really it's really complicated in these kind of networks of behavior um we can have a behavior cast at some point yeah, we we'll grab we'll grab may at that for that one we can talk about sure. indirect genetic effects and how the genes of these animals can affect how they interact with each other uh i really you know at the start i talked about like you know you you start like you hear these red pills and some of them are so extreme that they're stupid uh, one I want to throw in really quick is I've heard like some in, like just just a few, but there's enough of them that I can call it a group that claim you can keep like that you should be able to keep male like domesticated betas together. Uh, um, the, the tried and true beta fraternity. <laughs> it's possible, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, like, um, if you have like a 150 <laughs> calendar. Like, I, I tried it once. I was curious. What um, I thing? put. I think I had three females and two males and a 55 heavily planted. They killed each other. <laughs> um, it's possible, I'm sure. Just yeah. I don't know what size tank. I mean, I've heard from other people that I believe that a 75 will generally work. This is interesting. Um, but don't do it. Because... <laughs> but if you have, yeah, if you have a 75, just fucking do something else. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm if, sure if Maverick turned his if Maverick does his fifty thousand gallon and makes it freshwater and puts two male bettas in it, I guarantee they probably won't even find each other. But yeah, Mad, one of our favorite people, just said in chat, I've heard that massive tanks and extreme black water will allow beta breeding groups. Yeah, because they can't see each other. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, it gets to a point where it's like, why bother? Like, oh, I know a way to stop bettas from being aggressive to each other. Just keep them both in the cups they came in. <laughs> you know what else you can do to actually keep males together this is this is this is a an oscar original method you can write this one down credit me in the paper when you do this one remove their eyes <laughs> it's You're done, dude, You're done. Oh, what are the, aren't there the dragon scale ones where it like grows over the, the scales grow over their eyes and makes them blind does carbon affect nutrients in the water column towards plants Um, no. I don't know the answer to this because I'm not a plant person at all. Right, none of us, um, really. none of us know anything about plants. Okay. I've asked. No, I mean, I'll I'll pitch in so we have just on. I don't know. I asked a buddy of mine who's a plant genius if this was a thing because I've heard this many times as well. Yep. Um, he said no. Okay. He said carbon is not going to remove uh, any nutrients in the water column. Here, I I know someone who does know. You want me to get May in on this one? Sure. You're up, May. Hey, May. Give him hell. Give him hell, King. Oh, okay. Jesus. Okay, so I wrote this entire thing a while back, and I used to give it to almost every single customer that came in in regards to keeping plants and why I thought it was always a good idea for a smaller or larger tank to keep plants inside of a system. So the question is, does carbon affect uh, nutrients or anything that the plants would need? It's, it's a loose yes is what I would give it. I would absolutely it it affects the chemical composition of the water because it's uh, an, orga an organo compound absorbing agent, right? That's what carbon wants to do, and you have many of these compounds. Whenever you have uh, dissolved waste, it dissolves into your uh, urea type things, and your ammonia, and your potassium, your PO four, and those are all susceptible to absorption through different media's. But it's not going to be sufficient unless you have like 100% water filtration through this large mass of carbon to really affect the growth of plants. They're going to be more reliant on things like having adequate carbon in the water to turn to mass or having adequate nitrogen in the water to become mass or the appropriate light to so the plants can outcompete the algae. So a loose yes in that, yes, it affects the water chemistry in a way that plants can detect. No, not really enough to affect your growth of plants. And we're going to, at some point, we'll do a plant podcast and we'll grab May and Noodles and we'll have a crazy plant talk. I can only talk about plants if we're talking C3, C4 plants because I know a little bit about that, but we're not, I ain't, I ain't out here pretending to know any of this stuff. I Thanks, May. I just know, May. I just know sometimes they grow and sometimes they don't. 
And more times than not, they don't. <laughs> yeah, thanks, that was very informative. I didn't know any of that. Um, the next question might actually just be my favorite question of all of these. I've been waiting to get to this one. I love this question so much. All right, get ready for this one. This one's a doozy. Dude, I'm so excited. Cycling is a linear process, and a tank is either th cycled or not cycled. I... I love I love everything about this question. It, this this statement is it's so bold. <laughs> it's bold. It's out there. Cycling is a linear process, and a tank is either cycled or not cycled. Cycling is a flat circle. <laughs> um, no, no, no. It, cycling is not a linear. Well, it is a linear process, but it's not. Well, I wouldn't say linear, but it's certainly not just. First of all, I don't think Guffy understands what a linear process is. <laughs> Dude, it's linear. It's a straight line. Your tank goes from not cycled to cycled. Yeah, linear doesn't... I think he's confusing linear and just binary. Because it's not... Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> linear definitely doesn't mean just yes or no. Um, <laughs> and uh, because I'd say it... I mean, obviously, it's not purely linear. It's probably some sort of... Because of the way most bacteria replicate, you're probably going to see something a little bit more. Um, uh, you're going to see something closer to exponential than linear, but um, it's certainly not binary. I can tell you that it's not like the bacteria are just not there and then they're just there. <laughs> <laughs> you go from none to all of them. Yeah, that's like some Lamarckian evolution right there. It's not quite how that works. Um, yeah, I'd say cycling is probably more of an exponential slash linear process. It's not binary, but I love this question, Guffy, and you are the MVP of this uh, podcast. Yeah, I mean, there's some truth to the idea that a tank is either cycled or not cycled. You know, if you throw fish into a tank with a brand new filter and no source of beneficial bacteria, beneficial nitrifying bacteria, that tank is not cycled. Um, whereas if your tank is absorbing the amount of waste being produced in a, an efficient manner and you don't see any ammonia or nitrite, then your tank is cycled. But um, obviously it's not a completely binary thing. But I think that you can say a tank is either cycled or not. Yeah. <laughs> I, will read out my, I, think... I will read out my two favorite messages about this now. Shorting their cycle. Until the water is tested, the tank is both cycled and not cycled. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Sunlight we... causes algae. I don't know. He, he, this is the one I hear a lot. All those pet smart people like to say, well, my tank's next to the sun. That's why it has algae. Um, and there is some truth to that, though. I mean, yeah, I mean you I... just, you know... You have your aquarium lights on. It's in direct sunlight. You're probably gonna you're gonna make it real easy for that algae to grow. I think uh, any excess light. I mean, there's a lot of. I think there's a lot of different. There's different types of algae. I don't know how algae works, but I can tell you this. I have a jar in my windowsill, and it's green water. And then I have a little like nano tank next to my windowsill, and it's not green water. I don't know what the difference is. They're both they're both just sand sticks and microfauna, but one's full of algae and one's not. So there you go. Yeah, I also think um, it's just you can do I, I what I would never want is people to think that sunlight is like a curse for your tank. Oh, and, yeah, definitely. Because not. there are amazing sunlit tanks. You can do sunlit tanks. Sunlit it tanks works. Are awesome. Just yeah. I mean, you just got to have some way to control the amount of light that tank is getting. Not even control so much as you know how much light it's getting and you yeah. know how to appropriately work with a the tank there yeah i mean it, it's a killer for a lot of people that don't understand how their tanks work because <laughs> it's going to be yeah. extra light um and so if you're speaking to somebody new to fish keeping and they have their fish tank right next to their uh window and they have algae that's probably a contributing factor and I don't um, think it's a coincidence that the person who asked that question is Poultry, who has a sunlit macro tank, and it's one of the <laughs> nicest tanks I've ever seen. Yeah, I have sunlit tanks too. My um, Trophius tank is sunlit, and you know how much algae is there? 
Uh, I a little bit. No. I, I do it's not, not algae list, but it's not it's not overrun by algae by any stretch. I wish I had a um, I wish I had a sunlit tank. I don't think the but it's also heavily planted. I don't think the half gallon scud tank counts, but you know what? It, it, well, I'll say it does. <laughs> uh, okay, these next few questions aren't really questions. <laughs> um, are there any more questions? There's a yeah, um, there's more. Says, I'm just... Fish can be gay. Probably not. <laughs> Is it pleasurable to fish when they have sex? Probably not. Uh, I don't <laughs> think that fish are like that. Um, um, can you start I a mean... cycle in your tank by pissing in the tank? Probably, but please don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would assume any most cases of fish homosexuality are likely due to um, a larger male... Or a larger male mistaking um, a juvenile <laughs> male as a female. Oh no! That's actually, um, you know, fruit flies. Yeah, I um, I'm aware of them. Newly, newly emerged juvenile fruit flies will release the same pheromones the females have, which will cause nearby males to attempt to mate with them. That is the but most this fucked is just... up thing I've ever heard. <laughs> the the reason that happens is so that those nearby males don't just beat the shit out of them and kill them. Huh, and okay, it only lasts smart. for a few hours after. So there can literally be, you you come out of your pupa, you just you bright eyed looking at the world. Some giant dude starts trying to hump you, <laughs> and then like three hours later he tries to kill you. That is the life of a fruit fly. Damn, fruit flies, <laughs> fruit flies are hardcore. <laughs> yeah, no, it ain't a, it ain't a great species to be. Um, Better we have small uh, tank is happy. Slash um, bubbles. I guess, I think, is this like about like people see a bubble nest so they think the bed is happy? I, I, don't, I, I don't I don't know bedas. <laughs> maybe. I mean, a lot of people say, well, my fish is reproducing, so it's probably happy. And by a lot of people, I mean Jim. Jim says that a lot. And most of his fish die soon after, so they're probably not that happy. For, for, for reference, Jim added hatchet fish to his tank. They spawned immediately and then all died. So, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um... Sometimes fish, or sometimes animals as a whole, I should say, because I don't know fish too much, will spawn in stressful conditions because they assume that they are not long for this world. So maybe, I'll, I'll, maybe throw in, I'll throw in the point for, it's not just for bettas, but for small fit, kind of like some smaller species like Dario and just, I don't know, it's like anything, just stuff like that. You know, it's sometimes it's, it tanks, obviously you can't keep them, you shouldn't keep them in a cup, but like... You know, keeping them in like a five, like a heavily planted five gallon that's like well filtered is probably better than like chucking him in a bare bones ten gallon with absolutely nothing. So, it, it's not just you know tank small bad. You know, it's it's you gotta you gotta. There's other factors there at play there. Yeah, I. It doesn't look like we have too many other um, myths here to bust. Does oh, we got, anyone we have got, any others? We got one more. Of? We got one more from oh. Walrus. It's about, it's just a, it's a quick, it's a very fun one. It's about pests in freshwater. Now, let's be honest, most, like, pests you're going to find, like, you know, scuds, ice, like, aquatic ice pods and scuds, like, really, I, I've been told scuds will attack shrimplets. I don't know if there's any truth to that. Andy, would you know? Um, probably not. Yeah, I mean, scuds I thought, are mostly to try to avoid. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I was, that was the impression I was under. They they don't even have the mouth parts for that really. Uh, yeah, I don't. Um, they got like tiny little claws, but I doubt that's gonna. I've also so another like I'd say the two like pests that actually you know that actually freak people out are like planar like that I can think like that I can think of like something you can see like would be planarian and like hydra. So hydra are like you know the funny the ironic thing with hydra is that they're typically not an issue unless you're trying to add microfauna to your tank so it's like oh hey my tank's bioactive i have copepods swimming around oh but now there's hydra and they ate all the damn copepods so it's like a self-creating issue they're cool you know they're like little freshwater coral things they might hurt baby fish or shrimplets but i don't know i've never had i, I have not hurt baby fish they won't <laughs> well maybe like no. maybe like pygmy sunfish fry you know those are small that's even way too big for Hydra. Really? really? Okay. Yeah. Hydra are really cool. Like you yeah, said, they they're cool. some of the few freshwater nadarians, freshwater coral per they're, se. They're dope. Like I like them. Um but they eat small crustaceans. If you feed live food, yeah, like right. um I've had Hydra pop up in a lot of tanks of mine that I feed um live baby brine shrimp to on a regular basis. 
Yeah. I just dump Fenben in the tank and it kills them. <laughs> um, yeah, don't don't scrub them off the glass because I'm pretty sure that just makes more. <laughs> Could be wrong about that. Probably. But, uh, and a Planarian. I fuck, man. Are you really scared of the little triangle worm? Like, what's he gonna do? Apparently, they can zap shrimplets again. I've had them in tanks with shrimp, and I've never it never like saw a real diminish in the population. So I don't think they're that. I don't think they're anything. I mean, to be they definitely of. can, but yeah. same deal. It, I've think, done the same thing. Yeah. I think what it comes down to is, look, if your tank is so full of planarian that there's no shrimp anymore, I think that's. I don't know what to tell. Like, I I'm more impressed than anything. Like, how did you do this? What I'd say is, in my tanks, if I see hydra, I'm like, hey, cool, a hydra. It'll usually be gone pretty soon. Yeah. If I see an amphipod, I'm like, I love you and I hope you survive, but I know something's gonna eat you, but I love you. <laughs> Like, I love amphipods. They're some of my favorites. They're, they're great. They're so perfect. Um, I don't like planaria, but if I see planaria, I'll just feed less for like a week, and then they'll be gone, usually. Like, I don't find planaria or planaria in most flatworms. I think are, if you know what you're doing, they go away pretty quick. Yeah. I had them show up in, like, I've, I usually they would just be in like my, like my bowl, because that's like the real bioactive setup. But they showed up in my 10-gallon for a while, and my sword tails just literally ate them off the glass, so... <laughs> it wasn't an issue for very long. Okay, Walrus says they leave like trails so they can zap shrimp if there's like too many scooting around in one area. Okay, that's cool to know. I didn't know that. I mean, do yeah. we, okay, do we got? Should we unmute people now and see what they if they got anything to? I I was just gonna say I I think freshwater pests are a lot easier to get rid of than most oh, yeah. of your saltwater right. ones. I also think so freshwater I... pests are underrated. Um. I have pest snails. Can I get a loach to eat the snails, please? I swear to what? Like, what is the problem with pond snails? What like? People overfeed their tanks because because everyone does, and they're stupid. And then they have two hundred snails, and they're worried about it. But I tell people, you can get a loach or an assassin snail if you want to. But the biggest thing with your snails is. You're overfeeding. Yeah. And you just need to cut down feeding a bit. Snails are good. Yeah, I always say Um, that. Especially like ram swarms are really good algae eaters. Stuff like pond snails and bladder snails. Not quite as good algae eaters, but they do eat any of our food, which is going to help with nutrient issues in your tank. Kind of um, I think they're cute. Yeah, and they're cute. And it adds to the biodiversity in yeah, your tank, exactly. which I think is really nice. I like having like, nice biodiversity. Like, I feel like I have an ecosystem, not just fish and stick. <laughs> well, yeah. one, th one thing you said that I don't necessarily agree with, I don't believe any invertebrate can be cute, but <laughs> um, maybe a few cephalopods. I don't know. Maybe I, there's, a few. there's like there's this one, I don't know what kind of, like there's like the giant pond snails and they have like, you can see their eyes and I don't know, I think it's cute. I, it's just, it's, it's one you thing I hear a lot. The, uh, the giant hear... African land snails are cute? No, those things are disgusting. What? I, I, Let me I find hate the those... giant pond snail. Hang on. I hate those people who are always like, look at my snail. Isn't he so cute? Like, did your mom love you enough? It's not cute. Oscar, I'm going to start, do start doing that as much as possible. Yeah, that animal is hideous, all right? That shouldn't cute. be alive. Bro, that is hideous. I like this lad. No, no. It, <laughs> no. Jesus Christ. No. Uh-uh. I'm not having it, all right? I just caught two slugs today. They are my friends. I'll take a Grammy over a snail. Wait. <laughs> no. No, I won't. But, um... <laughs> okay, how about, how about this snail, though? This terrestrial snail? Yeah, it's a terrible animal. Bro, he's blue. Terrible. He's blue. Yeah, I, I don't care. What about that... these feather no. millipedes I have? Yeah, no, those are cool. that terrible animal. <laughs> you, okay. All right, I guess as a, you know, someone who studies insects, I should probably be less against invertebrates. <laughs> But, um, dude, how can I, he, I? How can he eat mystery snails? I actually like most of these inverts you're sending me, except for the fucking snails and fuck gastropods. What about uh, the giant apple snails? No, I don't like them. No, not one bit. <laughs> no, uh, sir, Kubaris like SP them. Amber. Conches? No, conches. Uh, Walrus just asked, "What about conches?" Conches are cool. I have have you have you guys ever seen a conch in the wild? I've seen conches in the wild a few times. They were always crazy cool. 
thing of those weird googly eyes staring at you. That was that was that's one of my favorite. That was <clears throat> I I was in Bon Air scuba diving mangroves, and there was flounder, these big mangrove fields, and then there was conches, and the conches were so cool to see them just looking at you. Okay, so yeah, I'll conches. give you that one. I'll give you that one. Look at those little conch guys. Oscar, yeah, how do, you, how, do you, how do you feel that I bred terrestrial slugs? Uh, that that disgusts me. <laughs> that disgusts me. I didn't do it on purpose. It just happened. And that one thing I, I love about those conches is that you you like a lot of the time when you see these invertebrates, you see them more as like like a plant or something that's just there. But those conches follow you with their eyes. They're looking at you. Conks are smart. Conk. They're smart. Yeah, this is, I love them. I love them. Big fan of conches. Conk, conch, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not good at pronouncing things. I say Just, conk. Is it right? I don't know. I say I, cock. I've heard both. Yeah, it's well, probably not that. <laughs> I, I, I say conch, so it's probably conk. Because <laughs> I pronounce everything wrong. Just just watch Game of Thrones with me and watch me say names. Um, do we want to unmute our others and have a convo with some of the people who've been listening in? Uh, real quick, I just want to say the reason it's conk is because then the horse conch is a horse conk. <laughs> and that's just funny. Yeah, let's unmute people oh see what my. they have to say. All right, let's get May in here. Let's get Mad in here. Mad's one of our favorite people. So is Mate Senor in here. Love that dude. Amazing guy. Walrus. Walrus always welcome. Um, and th those are also people. Anytime they want to do a podcast with us, just let us know. We'd be happy to talk to any of y'all. Big fans. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hello. So, what are some aquarium myths you guys have been thinking about, or anything we said that you think we're wrong or stupid? Or <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty stupid. I yeah, honestly, I'm three steps we're all away really from learning we stability. Just, <laughs> we just have fish takes and point and laugh at them. I think the only thing I could add would be how you uh, mentioned fruit flies and the smaller males acting like females. And uh, how some cichlids, like apistos, do this do a similar thing so that they don't get beat oh, yeah? up. Yeah. yeah. And then the smaller males, they'll pretend to be female just so they don't get beat up. And sometimes they're convincing enough the other males will even start trying to court them. Well, There's also like a, it... lot, a lot of stuff that does that. Like, uh, do you know about a midshipman? Like those, they're like little toadfish or something. I don't know. The croakers, they're loud. Yeah. There's like some, there's like a, like a morph of males that are like, look like females. They kind of like sneak into nests and fertilize Sneakers. eggs. Yeah. That, that was just what I was going to say. In a lot of cichlids, midshipmen, and a lot of lizard species too, you see yeah. sneaker, satellite, and dominant males. And those dominant males, when they have a female, they try to defend that female. When a sneaker female, a sneaker male, sorry, I'm... There are three types of males. There's just one type of female. I don't. I'm sorry. I'm saying things wrong because I'm sleepy. But those <laughs> dominant males will try to defend its female so they can mate with us. The sneaker male will impersonate a female and will try to sneak in to secretly mate with the females of the dominant. And then the satellite male will will defend a female, and the satellite males can identify these sneakers and kick them out. But they're not strong enough to beat the dominant males. So you basically had a triangle of three different phenotypes of these species that can all, each one has uh, another phenotype that they can beat and that they can get beaten by. It's kind of an interesting triangle that we see in a few different species in nature. Is it, right, um... That's like the, the one fence alert, right? The, well, I think it's a fence alert. Sorry, say it again? It's like a, that's like in a, some kind of fence alert, right? Like, yeah. like the males have different colored bellies or whatever? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, um... Don't Dario Dario do something similar too, where it's yes. very very hard to find females because the subdominant males disguise themselves as females. I mean, I just think it's more of a thing as um, uh, exporters don't typically send females because they're gray and uh, some people don't want them. Um, but also, yeah, a lot of the times you go into a fish store and you see a tank full of Dario Dario. Uh, if you want a female, you're going to try and grab the one with the least amount of color, no striping, solid gray body and fins. Um, not always going to be a female, as uh, our lovely spiritual has found out. Um, he was killed it the could next day. always just be 
a subdominant male that's colored down. Um, I tried to get spiritual pair of Dario Dario. I did my best. I grabbed the most likely to be a female of the tank. The male killed it. Probably was also a male. Just a subdominant male. And one thing that you'll notice, a lot of those species that exhibit these behaviors are relatively evolutionarily new. This is so, this is a relatively new behavior in the grand scheme of the phylogeny of fish life. <laughs> and lizards, too. <laughs> yeah. And lizards. So, I have... Wait, so is it something that kind of gets like less selected for over time? Uh, no, it gets more selected for in a lot of these more derived species. Oh, yeah. I have... I, I've got something on this, too. Uh, who was that? Matt, if you want to go first. Oh, I was going to change change to a different aquarium myth, so you go ahead. All right, awesome. So on this one, I just wanted to add that this is a trait that occurs in cuttlefish as well, where they can actually do a type of asymmetry where they will present the male attributes visually towards a female while presenting female attributes towards the surrounding males. So they can sneak by and present I'm ready to mate to the to the local female and I'm just here for your protection to the male. And I mean cuttlefish have been around for what some like 450 million years. But uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting point, but did those ancient cuttlefish exhibit that behavior would be your question. Yeah, I mean I will never know that, but yeah, we'll... I'm, I'm just saying it's another it's another species that's also attributing the same behavior. Yeah, I, I didn't know that about cuttlefish. I don't I don't know much about them cuttlefish, but that's amazing. Cuttlefish uh, are cool. Sorry, I, I feel bad. Everyone's interrupting Matt. Sorry, Matt. What were you no. saying? Um, <laughs> I almost interrupted you. I'm bad. This it's... is your chance. Change the topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I I don't keep salt water, and I've never kept clowns. So I don't know. Like I don't know if this is just a meme or what it is, but one thing that I've seen just around on discord and on fish forums is the idea that if you want like tank raised clowns to host an anemone you can put a picture of clowns in an anemone or a video of clowns in an anemone and put it next to the tank and they yeah, will this... learn how is this a thing people do this is that... real i did it yeah i had real. a pair of tank raised uh cinnamon clowns amphiprime melanopus and I put in a bubble tip, and they wore nothing to do with bubble tip. So I went on Google, and I found a stock photo of Nolanopus clowns and a bubble tip anemone, and I taped it to the side of the tank. And within a few days, they were in the anemone. That is the I'm most amazingly that. stupid thing I've ever heard, and I love it. <laughs> no, no, there's, there's really a stupid, but like, I'm not surprised, because you know, fish have really good vision, like color vision and stuff, you know? Uh, so I think that uh, fish only have two, I think. Think cones compared to our three but so the question i have on this is the picture that you took and you posted near the fish were the fish in the photo bigger than the clowns you had in the tank they were very similar size so i figured I've done, out so it would be a similar size so mimicry and behavior is very very common especially if uh, if an animal can identify another animal as being the same thing which we're really good at doing we can't really Animals have a hard time picturing themselves in mirrors and understanding individualism, but knowing that something is the same as them, they have that, uh, that kind of gut feeling, even though they can't see themselves. But I've had success doing this, not with a picture of the clowns, but another picture of a larger fish, so a potential predator, uh, triggering the, the type of behavior where they would utilize the, the anemone as a form of defense. <laughs> this is amazing. Is, I love this. That is really cool. This but is like... This it's is so by, dumb, but I love it. This is by far the, the, my favorite thing I've learned out of salt water. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know of that trick specifically, but uh, I mean, that's definitely good to know because no one wants their, you know, they, they buy these fancy clownfish, spend a lot of money, and they decide their nest is going to be at the top right of your aquarium at the Wave Maker. So it's <laughs> good to know. I also, I also think um, I would definitely be down to do a fish physiology cast at some point where we talk about eyesight and stuff like that because i have a lot to say about loose jaws and their ability to see red light mm -hmm. in the deep sea so i really did cool. a paper on that oh, like like, like a pharyngeal jaws are like the real like fucking weird shit <laughs> yeah no there's there's a lot of in i mean the, they they basically shine 
a red light that can basically only be seen by their species. And there's mm. been a few theories about it. But, yeah, fish, uh, are, fish are fucking weirder than like people most than like most people give them credit for. Yeah, I've, like, I've like, done like, it. People forget that most fish have like two sets of jaws, just like casually. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I've done a few papers on some deep water fish, so I'd love to talk about that at some point. I'll, I'll dig up my papers and brush myself up on it. God, yes. And I will I will sit there saying absolutely nothing, for I am not intelligent enough. <laughs> fish science. No, this is, this is actually... I, see, I liked this question because it, it really is a, a better question than I think it was intended to be. So... <laughs> So when you talk about like the can fish be gay, well, that comes down to do fish utilize emotions for selective breeding? Uh, probably not. So likely no. However, is it pleasurable for fish to have sex? This is a kind of two tiered thing because what are the, the guiding principles of reproduction? Now, fish typically, with exception to like sharks and stuff, don't have penetrative sex. So the physical pre pleasure may not be there, but the 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 psychological pleasures maybe because you need to have some type of driving force to get them to continue to uh engage in the behavior and if it's not physical like it is in us then then really what is it so i would argue that yes it is pleasurable because something is making them do it but not in the same way that we would think yeah i mean i don't think it's the same as um humans and any stretch of the imagination but i think that obviously they fish have that inherent all animals have that inherent drive to reproduce. Yeah, you're right. Um, it's it's I think one of the uh, the defined characteristics of life. Yeah, is the desire to reproduce. Exactly. And I think we're with something like that. We're going to come down to fundamental. Fundamentally, you're going to to talk about something like that. First of all, you're going to have to go into how a fish perceives something we would define as pleasure, which is going to be. A whole topic of Jeez. science that is basically unexplored. But, it, uh, does it excite neurons to do it? Yeah. So I'll, you're going to have to look at neurons. My, but be, beyond neurons, you're going to have to look at the genetics behind this. You're going to have to look at nature and nurture. You're going to have to look at environments where it's raised. There's even the, the concept of instinct is a difficult concept to grasp because mm. there's instinct brings into the idea uh, like what anything that an animal innately knows. So if, if you get a, a fish, you throw away its parents, it doesn't have any parents, it grows up on its own. Little dumb orphan fish. Um, <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> you chose like the most awful way of saying that, and I love it. <laughs> so little dumb orphan fish is not going to have any parents. He's probably still going to have that drive to reproduce. So that's going to be something that's innately genetic. Yeah. And the thing with genetics is that there's a lot that contributes to them. Your environment is going to affect your genetics. Epigenetics. Epigenetics is something I'd love to talk about on the podcast at some point. Mm -hmm. And that's basically that direct methylation patterns from your ancestors are apparent in your genes innately. And those will affect the way you the the, the way you act, the way your your phenotype appears, and your phenotype is going to be basically the physical manifestation of your genetics. It's going to be how those genetics appear in your person. So I think with something like that, we we could do a whole podcast talking about this. There's so much going on. Yeah, that, that would oh, yeah. I'd be happy to take part in, but I would need like two weeks notice to compile yeah, my research. Of course. And figure uh, you know, out something cool. intelligent to say on the topic. Like a, maybe like a podcast of like, I, I, I guess like fish intelligence or something. I don't know. I, I don't think there's much like actual literature on the topic, but like, I don't know. It, it'd be cool to see more because like, you know, like a, like a tetrodontiforms are like, you know, anecdotally or some, you know, people say they're, you know, some of the more smarter kind of fish. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I would I, agree. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Um, I don't know. It'd be, it'd be neat to see more like actual research into like, you know, what's even going on in their heads. Well, one thing on, on intelligence and in fish that even perplexes me is that you'll see, say that you keep a an older fish, maybe even a, a holos, um, holos die, some sort of um, gar or something like that, and you compare the intelligence of that creature to maybe um, some sort of ciprinodontiform or something. And it's, it's strange to see, does 
an ancient species exhibit that same level of intelligence as a more derived species. And sometimes it feels like, I, I don't want to say it is because you, cognition in fish is such a difficult concept to even grasp. It's, I haven't researched it enough. But how do these evolutionary ancient fish appear to show more intelligence and higher cognition than these more derived species? I think that's I mean, it's probably, just... well, for them, it's probably just like, you know, it, they probably have like more like potential resources to exploit or like potential prey. So, you know, gotta like think more about how to, you know, do that stuff. It probably comes down to like the evolutionary pressures or whatever. You know, I would want to argue the opposite because you have these older mm. fish where there's less potential predators, less cognitive energy needs to go towards being able to select or sorry, to identify um, like areas or my apologies. I, I worded that backwards. They require more intelligence in the past because there are more uh, things that they need to worry about. Whereas now you have all these hyper focused niche uh, niches where a small fish doesn't need the cognitive ability because it fills a role where predation is pretty singular and hiding places is pretty singular and i live in the river i hide under the rocks and i look out for bigger fish it doesn't take a whole lot of cognitive power yeah what's the deriving force to develop that type of cognitive power it's going to be threats you know animals get smarter mm -hmm. because there's more threats and if you look at a real old yeah. fish out in the ocean it's a lot of threats yeah but and, like something i just noticed is that like a lot of the like smarter animals tend to be like kind of like omnivorous or at least have like a lot of potential you know food resources to explore like you know primates, uh, bears, uh, mono lizards, um, probably some other stuff that I'm forgetting. Oh, uh, elephants. Elephants can find a lot of food sources. I don't know. Yeah, I... I oh, ahead. sorry. I was, I was just going to say I'm, I'm more with May on this one. Yeah. Where you're going to have... There's obviously going to be a lot of selective pressures working on these organisms, but also when you're exploiting a more simplified niche, you need um, that extra maybe brain power cognition is just a use of energy that is maybe unnecessary. Yeah. So you can eventually start to work that down. But in 2020, to be a fish, whoa, whoa, are there many more selective pressures than there were back in the day? And so that'll be interesting to see how fish change, which I'll never get to see because it'll be millions of generations, but it'd be cool for whoever comes long after I die. Maybe they will, maybe they will find this podcast the on a VHS. Runoff. I didn't hear anything either of you just said. You said at the same time, but <laughs> I, I agree just, with you. I made a dumb joke. <laughs> Amazing. I, I also made a dumb joke. <laughs> so it it was it was cool that you know mentioned earlier about genetics and memory and uh, I guess to a lesser sense you mentioned instinct. There's a commonality in between cultures all around the world and i'm not sure if you're aware of this and it's not really relevant to the fish in the whole but it is relevant to the instinctual part uh the prevalence of dragons in cultures that never communicated have you ever read of anything like this no i i am very much evolution in animals i am not culture so this this is a really neat one so my my primary focus in life has been uh culture and behavior and psychology that's just what i do for a living and there's this really neat topic where you've got dragons and they occur on almost the same way throughout the world independently of each other so these communities these cultures never really communicated the idea of a dragon but they have commonalities between each of the dragon and when you start taking these apart you typically have the the head of a serpent which would be like your snake or lizard or something like that the the wings which are typically uh hawk-like in nature and then you have the legs like the four legs where they look kind of like a panther and the idea behind this is we all draw these because these come innately from the from our instinct of things that we should fear growing from or having had evolved from common smaller mammals where the common sources of predation were larger reptiles eg snakes and the such hawks or avian uh types of predators and leopards larger mammals and those were the three things that we that we all commonly learn to fear. And though we've evolved into animals that no longer have to worry about those types of threats, that thought is still there from when we were all, you know, field mice. Well, I mean, well, even then, like for like the more like kind of like larger, like hominids, you, you still have stuff like, you know, leopards and crocodiles. And, and like, I mean, probably some some sort of large birds that could, could have specialized in like large men, like, like large farm rates, like um. 
Like, yeah, you had large ones in, food, in Australia. Care. It's not in Africa. Yeah, you, I, you, you had some of the such in Africa. Yeah. Uh, my apologies, in Australia and such that that could predate on uh, on humans or hominids. Yeah. But the idea that all of those have been gone for such a long time, as soon as we developed the concept of teamwork, those threats all but disappeared. But the idea is still there, even in places where they don't really have such threats or they never should have realistically experienced those threats. I mean, I, I wouldn't say like totally, but I'm pretty sure it was like some sort of like isotope studies on like the leopard fossils or something that like they, they did eat hominids. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you're always going to catch the one off. A lion can still kill a person. <laughs> Well, yeah, but, but, but I think we think, I think the isotopes show that they like they're pretty like regularly eating, mm -hmm. like so, at least some sort of ape. But you know, yeah, I think um, I think I I don't know my anthropology too well, so I um, I don't want to comment on that. But um, yeah. one thing I do know pretty well is my genetics, and I think epigenetics, uh, way back in the day of like. 30 years ago, epigenetics was probably one of the biggest breakthroughs in genetic history. And that's kind of this discovery of these methylation patterns that lead to heritable phenotypes between generations, which I guess directly tie into what we consider to be instincts, the ability for you to inherit genomic changes from parents. And that, that's actually been linked to mothers that have had certain experiences while pregnant have led to offspring that have experienced similar um, emotional um, conditions. But the big one is, say, say you get a fat person and a skinny person. So uh, which one do you use fat? No one's fat. All right. So we'll just use <laughs> fat person and skinny person. Um, <laughs> I can be fat. That, fat say that. There are some people where if we eat the exact same diet, he is always going to be fatter than me. And we can eat the same diet, and but our metabolisms are just at some point different. And a lot of epigeneticists are linking this to kind of experiences from ancestors that have been inherited epigenetically. For example, if, you're, if all of your ancestors went through times of hard famine you're probably going to hold on to every bit of nutrition to a greater extent which may lead in, in our modern day where food is plent plentiful, you might get fat and be undesirable by humanity. Yeah, that's that's, really, only, really that's only recently an undesirable trait, though. Oh, I know. Yeah. Back in the day, it was desirable. I was just making a joke. I was just making a joke because our viewers are falling asleep, so I just wanted to make a fat <laughs> joke. <laughs> the joke is funny because fat people... <laughs> <laughs> to, to all our fat viewers... You are it's fat. not your fault. It's your genetic. <laughs> to all our fat viewers, you are fat. You're just getting fat. It's okay to be fat. It's okay. Like, look, I'm so skinny. It's like a, a health concern, probably. So, like, don't worry about it. To all our fat viewers, next time someone calls you fat, say, "I'm sorry, but my ancestors went through times of great starvation." So, like, I I, I, I know jack shit about genetics, but like, has has the epigenetics stuff been tied to like a like instinctual fears or something at all? Like. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's cool. I, I guess when you say ties, there's a lot more research that needs to be done in this field. Yeah. But um, if your ancestors lived in an area where there was constant fear of certain things, there is evidence to suggest that may be why we fear certain things. So uh. one thing I've learned about myself is that my Italian ancestors must have been fat slobs who were scared of nothing because I am skinny and not scared of anything. So this is this is great. I win. <laughs> so, so what you're telling I was going to say, is, is this the cat in the cucumber thing? <laughs> cat in the cucumber? Yeah, oh, it's like a, a, like a meme before. right now where they, they place cucumbers just... I mean, realistically, these cats have never in, engaged with like a snake or anything like that, but someone will put a cucumber when the cat turns around and sees it, they freak out because no identifiable feature you know no no real reason for them to do it but they do it well my dog freaks uh, yeah. out with every inanimate object but tried to attack a raccoon explain that my, my assumption for that would be that cucumbers vaguely are in the shape of a snake maybe it's something to do with that but i i don't claim to know this i don't claim to know this i don't 
I don't want, I'm going to be, everyone's going to be linking, oh, Oscar talked about cucumber snake. No, I don't know. I don't know. That would be my suggestion. I like how I just, I really just want your viewers to start putting cucumbers around cats and see what happens. I might also have this wrong, but don't, um, isn't citrus pretty bad for cats? Like, doesn't it make them fairly sick? And most cats have a very negative reaction to even smelling it. They'll like hiss or snarl or run away. I, I feel no like I've idea. seen this somewhere too. I mean, is, I mean, that's most plants. To be honest, like most plants, do not want to be eaten. We're just stupid and dumb and eat and eat things. <laughs> yeah, like peppers. For oh, example. whoa, whoa! That, that's peppers. that is not entirely true. Peppers love to be eaten by birds. Well, they yeah, but, something to, you know. Yeah, but we're not birds. birds. Like to be eaten. What was capsaicin <laughs> developed? How? Why they evolved to produce capsaicin? And so, other... like deter mammals from eating the fruits. So, because so because like they. Because like the the seeds get damaged in the stomachs of mammals, but like they pass through completely fine in birds, and then yeah. spread. And then the birds can't taste the olive resin capsium, so they they just ingest it without having to worry about it. But then humans were like, "Haha, mouth go burr." Yeah. So at, <laughs> at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is that cucumber snake isn't real; it can't hurt you. <laughs> but, <laughs> I like how we went from "Is tank cycling real?" to cucumber snake. 